This is Peter Munga. This is the man who is responsible for turning this simple building in 1984 in Kangema, Moranga County of Kenya to a bank worth $12 billion today. At the time, he aimed to give the unbanked tea farmers of the region access to short-term loans, but today he provides all sorts of financial services to 16.9 million people in the east and central of Africa. Equity Bank is today present in seven countries and records hundreds of millions of dollars as profit every year. Who would have thought that this man who left his secretary role at the Ministry of Water with 5,000 Kenya shillings and a dream would go on to build the fourth strongest banking brand in the world. Today, I take you through the incredible journey of Mr. Peter Kahara Munga and Equity Bank. I'm never a quitter. I don't know what quitting is all about. I will never quit. The story of Peter Munga begins in 1943 at the slopes of Abadeas in Kangema. His parents worked as tea plantation workers but later moved to Nairobi when his father opened a hotel in the famous Gikomba market. It is here that he got through most of his early education but this did not last long. During the 1952 state of emergency that Kenya experienced, his father was jailed and Peter's education was cut short and had to move back to the village with his mother. To Peter, being a bright student who enjoyed studying, this was a tough new reality to deal with. This drew the attention of an Italian Catholic priest in his hometown church who would change his life forever. The priest offered him a scholarship from the age of 12 in primary school to Gashianjiro High School where he sat his A-levels. This act of kindness from the priest will much later influence one of Peter's very impactful philanthropical programs that offers full scholarships to tens of thousands of young students in Kenya. Peter then went on to get a diploma in human resource and was later employed as an officer in the provincial administration. His run in government was successful and he climbed the government hierarchy until assistant secretary at the Ministry of Water. It was at this point that he decided it was time for him to venture out and pursue a dream he had. In 1984, he quit his job and went back to his home village in Kangema to actualize a microfinance institution idea he had. It would help tea plantation workers and the informally employed sector have access to soft loans. It was a small shop that had only five employees which he says started with only 5,000 Kenya shillings, which was around $100 today. He called this microfinance institution Equity Building Society, EBS. In nine years, EBS grew to 27,000 customers and five branches. These numbers, however, were not a correct indication of the institution's true state. It was experiencing 53% loan defaults and was making 5 million in losses every year. In 1993, Peter Munga decided to seek a little bit of help from someone he had was an accounts and commerce genius. Let's back up a little bit and focus on another important individual in this journey, Mr. James Mwangi. In 1962, in a village in Kangema, James Mwangi was born in a single mother family of seven. His father had been killed in the Mau Mau fights for independence earlier. His widowed mother had to find ways and means to feed and raise him and his siblings in a deeply rural Kenya setting. And we were left uh, with our mother Grace to bring us up. We were seven in the family, and so providing for seven kids, uh, for a lady who had not gone uh, for formal education and no economic activities, uh, it was challenging. His mother Grace went above and beyond to lay out a set of values in her children and more so educate them. She educated all her kids, including the girls, going against cultural norms where educating girls was unheard of. James attended primary school education at a nearby school where he passed outstandingly, and he received a government scholarship to secondary school. It is in this secondary school that he got introduced to accountancy and commerce. 
he fell in love with it and afterwards it was obvious that he would study a bachelor of commerce in kenya's top university of nairobi on the side he passed a certified public accountancy course cpa and was now ready to enter the real world to apply these well understood concepts of commerce and accounting james started his career at a high with a position at the esteemed price waterhouse coopers pwc in the uk as an auditor he moved to ernst and young another top tier accounting firm in the uk after 3 years in ernst and young he joined trade bank as a group financial controller it was at this time at trade bank in 1991 that he received an invitation from Peter Monga to save the drowning equity building society Peter Monga is now joined with James Mwangi and the then managing director John Mwangi James Mwangi deposits 7 million with equity building society which he turned to ordinary shares of the company he becomes a key shareholder with Peter and others and in 1993 James Mwangi is appointed director of strategy and finance with his new role at equity James focused on two things staff retraining and customer care he used his staff to recruit new members and paid them 25% of their salaries in shares the staff that previously had very low morale were now aligned in the vision that James bought them into as they tried to appreciate the value of the shares they held while other banks marketed to the wealthy in the society equity sought to convince the peasant farmers and workers which was a huge chunk of the kenyan population to bank with them they felt specially treated when working on the red carpets of the white painted equity office treating their customers as the most important people attracted more and more members the opening up of the banking culture to the low income population was made possible by equity removing the minimum deposit limit that most banks had prior to equity in order for you to bank with the then big banks such as barclays and standard chartered you had to have a minimum of 10 to 15000 in your account at all times an amount most kenyans could not afford then the growth between 1993 since james joined to 2000 was good but was only a foundation for the immense growth they were about to experience in the 21st century in 2000 The European Union as part of their poverty alleviation strategy supported the computerization of equity. It moved from having dozens of files to a central database that could be easily and conveniently accessed. The average time a customer spent at a teller moved from 30 minutes to 5 minutes. The year 2000 is also when equity carried the wave in the country with the viral Mimi ni member commercial. I'm a school director and I'm a member. However, as a microfinance institution, EBS was limited on the number of services they could offer. They wanted to become a bank. The regulation and licensing process by the Central Bank of Kenya was a gruesome one in the early 2000s. This was because of the surge of falling banks at the time that went to the blues with customer deposits. However, in August 2004, Equity Building Society became Equity Bank Limited and could now offer a full range of products and services. It was also at this time that they raised 11 million dollars in a record 2 weeks from private investors when the company ran out of capital. Equity Bank got another major boost of investment funding in 2007 when the giant Helios IFC and others bought 25% of the bank at 185 million dollars. With this, 
it invested in technology and became the most computerized bank in East and Central Africa. This brought with it a rapid and solid growth trajectory. It is not only funding that grew Equity Bank. Equity will literally hit the road traveling to remote areas in vehicles to provide banking products and services. This relentlessness to get people to bank with them paid off dearly. In the next five years, Equity Bank grew from 36 branches to 450 all over the country and region. The customer base grew from 100,000 to 17.5 million in seven different African countries. The assets of the bank grew to 11 billion dollars. Since 2006, when Equity Bank Group listed on the Nairobi Stock Exchange, its market value has grown close to a thousand percent. James Mwangi, with the early employees at Equity, have seen their initial investments grow significantly. For instance, the 7 million Kenya shillings that James bought shares in 1993 have since then grew to 12 billion worth of shares today. This growth has been a product of the democratization of banking that Peter Munga and James Mwangi have taken Kenya and its environs through the years. But equity is sure not yet done with its growth plans in the years to come. The future of Equity Bank is definitely one focused on majorly three things. Number one, Equitel. This is Equity's mobile phone platform that helps manage a customer's money remotely and also works as a telecommunication network. Equitel was introduced by Equity Bank in 2014 as a mobile network with mobile money transfer as its core feature. It was a clone to Safaricom's very successful product M-Pesa that I've extensively talked about in the documentary The Rise of M-Pesa. On its launch, Equity got 2.7 million users in only the first two years. However, this field of mobile network and mobile money transfer was a hard nut to crack for Equity. But if we can't beat them, you join them. Equity has worked with M-Pesa in various innovations such as the 247-247 M-Pesa to Equity Pay Bill, and we are sure to see more in the future. Equity also launched another arm in 2017 called FinServe that builds financial technology solutions for organizations and individuals. Equity Bank and FinServe have proved to be very good in creating solutions for the low-income population. It therefore looks very promising in innovating tech to cater for them in the future. Very few of our initiatives have gone beyond our borders and succeeded. And when I mean succeed, succeed as much as they've succeeded here. So we are trying to leverage the power of the equity group to push a lot of the fintechs, a lot of the startups, a lot of the developers out into the market so that we follow you and we make sure you have the kind of backing you need to sit around the table with those local companies or those international companies out there and say, look, we have the capabilities to support the business. The second thing we expect to see with Equity Bank in the future is more acquisitions of existing banks in regions they want to expand to. The first acquisition Equity Bank did was of Koj Bank of Rwanda in late 2023. Equity's market share in Rwanda significantly increased and moved Equity close to its target of 100 million customers by 2030. This is proof that as equity chases even more growth in the continent and the world, we expect to see more acquisitions and mergers in the future. With even the seven countries it has spread to, more is yet to be conquered by equity bank. Another equity bank creation we are yet to see more of is its philanthropical program Wings to Fly. This program was started in 2011 and it was aimed at giving scholarships to high-achieving orphaned and vulnerable students identified after the completion of primary school education. It has funded tens of thousands of Kenyan teenagers to further their education despite their lack of money. It has since then collaborated with international organizations such as Mastercard that has furthered their reach and impact. 
In the future, we are expected to see even more collaborations with governments, NGOs and corporates and in turn, the ability of many more African children nurtured to its full potential. Thank you for watching this mini documentary on the rise of Equity Bank. In the comment section below, tell me your thoughts on this and your opinion on what I have talked about in the video. As always, it was a pleasure writing and producing this documentary. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to leave a donation through our Mpesa till and join the community of video sponsors. Support us also through subscribing and I'll catch you in the next one. Cheers.